Praise God. Oh, good morning, my friends. Welcome once again to the vessel here. This is the day that the Lord has made and we will rejoice and be glad in it. Praise God. Thank you so much for tuning in today. Whatever time of day it is when you're actually listening, I say good morning, but it could be afternoon. It could be evening. Someone's getting healed of a cough and cold right now. Praise God. Glory be to God. Praise the name of Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Glory to God. We're so glad to have you, my friends. I would love for you to confess with me this morning something like this. Lord Jesus, thank you for another day. Thank you that this is the day that you have made. I fully intend to rejoice and be glad in it. I will rejoice and be glad. Thank you that your joy, O oh Lord, is my strength. Thank you that your truth surrounds me and makes me free. Thank you that I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Thank you for your word and thank you that your word is the ultimate truth. It is the final word on every matter. Thank you that I have, in the name of Jesus, the shield of faith with which I am able to extinguish all the fiery darts of the enemy. Thank you, Lord, that you never leave me nor forsake me, but that you are always protecting me. Your truth is my shield and buckler and my buckler. Thank you, Lord, that you bless me abundantly with good health. I am the healed and I am the healthy and the well. That's physically, that's emotionally, and that's in every other way possible. Thank you that I am the prosperous and the wealthy. That your blessing, Lord, makes me rich and you add absolutely no sorrow with it. Thank you, Lord, that you protect me and my family. You keep us all healthy and prosperous and safe. And wherever it needs to be, you make us to become those things. Thank you that no evil shall befall us. No harm shall come near us. Thank you that your angels, Lord, bear me up in their hands that I might not dash my foot on a stone. Thank you, Lord. Praise the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for every blessing, for divine favor, for divine promotion, for the glorious transformation inside out. Thank you for the fact that my reborn spirit is already made perfect. Thank you, Lord. Glory to God. Thank you, Lord, that you've chosen to love me even though I don't deserve it. Thank you, Lord, that I can call you friend for the privilege, Lord, of being your child, joint heirs with Christ. Thank you that you speak to me directly through revelation. Thank you that you will lead me this day and every day. Lord, without you and apart from you, I am nothing. So I praise you that you lead me and guide me every step of the way. I submit and surrender to you entirely, Lord, that your spirit will lead me, that your will be done. Throughout my day, the day that you have made, people will see you when they see me. And that my life, Lord, may be a living epistle for you, Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Glory to God. I commit it all to you, Lord, and I love you. I thank you and I praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. 
and amen. Well, praise God. Give him a shout of praise. Glory to God. Praise the name of the Lord. Glory be to God forevermore. What a joy it is this morning, as always, to speak with you, to share what God's given me to share. And we are about to start the fundamentals of faith, just as promised. Praise God. Now, before we do, I want to remind you, and I want to welcome you, if you are tuning in from Apple Podcasts, hello there, welcome. Be sure to subscribe so you don't miss an episode, and make sure you remember that you can ask any of your Apple devices, ask Siri to play uh, this podcast. Also, remember that you can download them to your Apple devices for offline listening, if necessary. Uh, Also, welcome from YouTube. And if you happen to be tuning in from YouTube, a shout out to you as well. And make sure you do three things for me, please. Like, subscribe, and hit the bell. What does that mean? That means leave a like on this video. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel at TTJ Tech if you've not already done so. And then don't forget to reach out and smash that notification bell because this is how you will stay in the loop with everything that we release as God leads us to do it. Praise God. Thank you, Lord. You know, God has something special for you today. And I, in our Bibles, I want us to turn to the book of Colossians chapter two. We are going to begin a journey and I've said it before. I'll say it again. Someone's getting healed of an earache and a sore throat. Glory to God. Praise the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. You know, if that's you, you receive it. We walk by faith and not by sight. You receive it by faith in the name of Jesus. You reach out and procure the, you, it is yours. But if you've got something else you, you uh, want to pray about, you, and you, there's another area of your life where you need help, you're dealing with something, you know what? Claim it there too. It doesn't have to be the sore throat or the earache that, that you, you know, you, God's healing. He is no respecter of persons. And he loves you and he will do what he says that he will do. He has given you all things that pertain to life and godliness and you can have them today. In fact, you already do. But you got to receive them by faith, you know, in Jesus' name. And so uh, they are yours. You are who God says you are. You have what he says you have. And so you receive it today by faith in Jesus' name. Now, praise God. Thank you, Lord. Glory be to Jesus. We are, uh, as I was about to tell you this, uh, which I've said on other occasions as well, There is a series that God has led me to begin on the fundamentals of faith, but it's going to take some time. We're going to revisit it every few days and continue as often as God leads, as often as God leads. And somebody's got a, praise God, somebody's got an ankle and foot cramp, foot cramp. Just really, you can barely move your foot. It hurts intolerably. Praise God for the the word there. But praise God, it's healed. You are healed. He has healed you in the name of Jesus. Praise the name of the Lord. Wow. Glory be to God. It is amazing. God is amazing. (laughs) I should say that. He is. He always is. And praise God, he he is moving these words that he's given to me. You know, this is awesome. Praise God, because you, Lord, you are awesome. Thank you, Lord. I love you so much, and I praise you. See this? (laughs) <laughs> Praise the name of the Lord. Glory be to Jesus forevermore. I mean, I, I love this. I love you, Lord. This is awesome. You know, we, we've not even gotten a message yet. Praise God uh, that, that God's uh, given me yet. And already he's doing, and he's got more healings in the work. Someone, someone hurt their elbow. You got a bruise. You banged up your elbow. You've been healed right now in the name of Jesus. Glory be to God. Thank you, Jesus. Glory to God. Praise the name of the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Praise God. We start today talking about the fundamentals of faith. As I've said, this is going to be a series that will last for several, I believe, months, not just weeks, but months, well into the summer. In the summer, we're going to be having our Bedford County Faith Summit, or BCFS, right here in beautiful central Pennsylvania. We'd love for you to attend in person if you can, and we'll have the details on that within the next two weeks. But if you can't attend in person, you'll also be able to attend online. All right, but we want to start talking about it here. We'll go through it. We'll take it, uh, you know, very slowly. And uh, you can never exhaust God's word, but you can certainly, you can milk it for a lot. You can dig and dig and dig into God's word, which is what he means. His word is the truth. In John 8, he says, you'll know the truth and the truth will make you free. Praise God. 
not just set you free, but it'll make you free. And and glory to God, that word no is is uh, the Greek word gnosko, which is an intimate relationship, not just uh, not just in your head, but heart knowledge here. So we want to spend lots and lots of time in the word, lots and lots of time talking about faith. We get through this series. I think God's going to lead us to do it again, maybe in, in you know, some different words and so forth, but we want to just keep going. Praise God. Now, before we can actually begin to really unpack the fundamentals of faith, we need to talk about truth and we need to talk about philosophy. Why? Well, you're going to see why in a moment. I've got to tell you, I probably really don't have to tell you because you already know that the uh, in this world in which we live, the idea of truth has really come under attack. And now we've got a lot of people out there who believe that truth is very, very subjective. We got people who say it's relative and, oh, you know, you got to find your truth that works for you. And, and that's the most important thing. And it's all, you know, your truth might not be my truth, right? And, and of course, I think we can easily very, very uh, comfortably say that that's not how God views truth at all. God is the truth. Praise God. Glory be to Jesus. So we're going to, we're going to look at this a little bit first. Um, uh, again, go in your Bibles with me, please, to Colossians chapter 2. If you have a Bible, if you have an app, I'll be using the Bible app from Life Church, also known as Version. U spelled Y-O-U. I want to praise God for this. I believe it's a wonderful gift of God, and I pray a special blessing upon the entire team who develops and maintains this app. Uh, I'm in Colossians chapter 2. I'll be reading it ver- starting with the eighth verse. And... You know that God's ways are far better than mine, far better than ours, far higher than man's ways, right? His ways are what matter. So we'll be going over lots of scriptures. Don't just believe them because I say them. Pray about them. Study them and meditate on them for yourself. You understand? Glory to God. Praise the name of the Lord. All right. In Colossians chapter 2 and verse 8, it says, Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit. There's that word philosophy, right? And vain deceit. After the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. All right. Glory to God. Let's stop there a moment and let's begin to unpack this a little bit. Beware. It starts off right away. Very strongly. And to really understand that, we've got to know that that word, that term beware actually comes from two Middle English words that mean be and war, be and war. So the implied here is to be at war or be on guard against something. Well, what is that something? And he goes on to say, lest any man spoil. Now, let's take a look at the word spoil here. What does he mean by spoil? We've gotten very mixed up about this. And, you know, we automatically think that that means, well, we shouldn't, uh, you know, we shouldn't uh, give our kids a lot of ice cream because that's going to spoil them. Well, first of all, actually giving your kids ice cream, uh, you know, obviously they got to have other food in their diet too, but really that's blessing them. And that's a godly thing. Giving is godly. Being kind and loving to your children and giving them things they want that will bring them happiness and joy. That's actually not spoiling them. That's not what he means when he says spare the rod and spoil the child. It's a very different thing, but that's also a very different message. Glory to God. So we're not going to get sidetracked right now, praise God, but just know that that's not the meaning of this anyway. That is totally different from what is meant here, lest any man spoil you. The word spoil here actually means to plunder as in war. So again, we're right back on that same topic of war, to steal or to rob from, to plunder. Okay, so when you're on guard against something, you're really vigilant, right? You're not slacking off in any way, and you are at war in in a warlike stance here on guard, very, very alert, that nobody in particular here plunders from you, robs you. Well, who do we know that is a thief? John 10.10 says that the thief Come is not except to steal and to kill and to destroy. Jesus came, of course, he said, I've come that they have life, that they may have life and have it more abundantly, life that is full and overflowing. So praise God, we've, we've got the answer there, but we also know who the problem is. And he is the defeated foe, but he, he operates as a thief. And that is, of course, none other than Satan, the devil. So be on guard that see to it that the devil doesn't rob you of everything Jesus died to give you. That is how we can properly interpret this. 
be at war, beware, be on guard, see to it that the devil doesn't rob you of everything Jesus gave you. Well, what has he given us? Jump with me real quick. Uh, if you can, if you want to keep a, a, a marker there of something there or, or on your app, make a mark, you know, but we're going to come back to this. But let's jump very quickly to Second Peter, uh, chapter number one, first chapter of Second Peter. OK, and uh, we're going to we're, we're going to look at the, the third verse. So here it is. Um, I'm already there, my friend. Second Peter, first chapter, chapter number one of Second Peter. As you might guess, it comes right after 1 Peter. Praise God. Oh, praise the Lord. Glory to God. Verse number three, according as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him that doth call us to glory and virtue. His divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue. And of course, we can break that down. We will later. We're going to come back to that scripture later and many others that confirm for us that the finished works of Jesus Christ on the cross do indeed include all things, not just for the sweet by and by, but even here for this life on earth, not just um, not just the eternal things, but even the temporal things. We've talked about that in previous broadcasts already. That word salvation is sozo. It, imply, it includes things uh, like and and beyond these, but it includes these as well, health and prosperity and soundness, safety, wholeness, preservation, all of these things and more. And when he said it is finished, he was not lying and he was not confused. He came to destroy the works of the devil and he was successful, my friends. So the finished works of Jesus Christ includes that. So his divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge. Well, the knowledge, you know, here again, we're going to get into that. You know, that's all coming, right? We can't do it all in one day, praise God, but we're going to, we're going to set the stage. So go back now with me to Colossians chapter number two again. See to it. That the devil doesn't rob you, plunder you, and take away everything or even anything that God, that Jesus has already died to give you. What has he given you? All things, praise God, that pertain to life and godliness. Amen. Glory be to God. How's he going to do it? Well, he goes on to tell us here, through philosophy and vain deceit, after the traditions of men, the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. Don't get your eyes off Jesus and don't fall into these, you know, winds of doctrine. Don't fall into these rudiments of the world and the traditions of men. The philosophy. So we've looked at we've looked at beware. We've looked at spoil. We've looked at what what Jesus has given us. Now let's unpack philosophy a little bit. A philosophy is a system of values and beliefs. You might say that your philosophy is the lens that you see the world through. The philosophy is the lens through which you view the world. A philosophy. Well, first of all, everybody has one, right? Everybody has a philosophy, whether you think that you do or not, you've got one. And I could put 100 people or even 10 in a room, ask them the same question or pose them the same circumstance, and they could all give me very different answers because of the philosophies which they hold to be true. And so that is the system of beliefs and values and so forth that kind of govern your life because it's what you see the world through, that lens. But now the question is, what if the philosophy that you have is wrong? Well, a wrong philosophy will cause you to jump to the wrong conclusions and to form or have the wrong response. Let me say that again. If you're taking notes, write it down. A, the, a wrong philosophy is going to cause you to jump to the wrong conclusions. Conclusions about what? Conclusions about God's character, about who God is and who you are in him, and to therefore have the wrong response to whatever circumstances you might face. And this is how, it's one of the, one of the ways that the, the devil uses, right? And we're going to really break it down here. We're going to see it. I'm going to give you an example of it, and we're going to then show you the process. Now, uh, the lens, I, I love that term lens, because we've got to see things through 
the, the right lens. And what the lens should be is God's word. That ought to be the lens, the measuring rod, the standard for everything by which everything is measured. And it is, if we'll believe it, it is regardless of whether we believe it or not, but it, it, will, it will work for you and it'll fight your battles for you if you will believe it, okay? The trouble is when you don't and things look very different. And I, I will never forget a story that, um, that I was told Years ago, my um, uh, my mother had gotten a new pair of glasses, and I believe it was a prescription, and it was supposed to be, a, you know, a great pair of glasses. And she put it on, and she looked, and the table looked like it was slanted. It looked like it was tilted. Well, she knew better than that. She said, uh, you know, I know the table isn't really slanted. Something is wrong with the glasses. They get the wrong lens. Something is going on with the lens. And, of course, she had to take it back and get the the, the fix for it. And, you know, praise God, everything was good. But you look through the wrong lens and it can cause some serious, serious problems. And I would like to show you that this is quite literally the oldest trick in the book, or at least the oldest one that's recorded. And it's, it's pretty early on. So, you know, this is Genesis. Now, I want you to jump back to Genesis chapter number one. And I want us to go ahead to verse number 26 um, it'll take me just a second or two. Well, a little more than this. I wonder if I can do it this way. Praise God. Yeah, I can. This is, this is, this is great. Praise God. Praise the name of the Lord. Glory to God. Here we go. All right. Now I want to go to, um, let's see. I want to go to verse number 26. Glory to God. Okay. This chap, uh, ver, uh, Genesis chapter number one, 26th verse says, uh, and God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. Verse number 27. So God created man in his own image in the image of God created he him, male and female created he them. Verse number 28, and God blessed them and God said unto them, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. Verse number 29, and God said, behold, I have given you every herb bearing seed, which is, okay, so we'll, you, you can keep reading. I mean, this is beautiful, you know, and, and it's not that long of a chapter, so you might as well just read it. Uh, but I want you to understand that when the, uh, and we'll see the details in the next um, chapter. So actually, go ahead and jump with me to chapter number uh, number two, and uh, let's, let's, um, Let's see. Let's look at verse number. Uh, okay. Let's look at verse number seven of Genesis chapter two. Uh, and then, and, and the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils, the breath of life and man became a living soul. The Kamash Bible actually says that man became another living, speaking spirit, just like God. Praise the name of the Lord. He created an exact copy. Glory be to God. Now, one was the creator. One was definitely the, uh, the one who had the uh, infinite, you know, created. I mean, God, you know, we're not, we're not saying that Adam uh, was going to be God. OK, because we always are uh, we always submit or should submit unto God. But other than that, this was this was to be. And not only that, but you see, Adam was created to rule, not to be ruled over. He would he would be in constant communion and submission to his father, but he would rule the earth. It said he created him and told him have dominion over the earth, over the birds of the air, the fish of the sea, the, all those that we just read that. So God, beca Adam became another living speaking spirit. First of all, you have to understand that he had that authority. And I just showed you the scriptures that prove that. All right. It is very important to understand that he had that authority right from the beginning. 
the um, there was a, 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 a an indicator one time. Somebody had said um, that the human mind has the ability to hold millions, millions of years of, of information, facts and otherwise. And it was stated by the great neurosurgeon Ben Carson that if a person ever used the full potential of what he had been given, that the entire earth would be subject unto him. Kind of sounds like Jesus. Glory to God. Amen. All right. So we understand now that Adam was, was created when God formed him from the dust of the ground, literally breathed the breath of life right into his face, into his nostrils. And the first words Adam heard, what God spoke to him back in chapter one, be blessed, be fruitful, prosper, replenish, have dominion over the fowl of the air, the birds of the, uh, <laughs> the birds of the air, the fish of the sea. Have authority. Be blessed. The very first thing Adam heard from his master was a blessing. Okay, now let's move on to uh, you can you can read here, uh, you know everything that happened. Um, Okay, let's see. Oh, we're looking. They talk about the rivers here. If you look at verse, um, still in Genesis 2, if you look at verse number 16, and the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, 17, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it, for in the day that thou eatest thereof thou shalt surely die. Eve is created. God creates Eve. Beautiful story. But I want us to jump ahead to chapter number three. And we will, um, well, we will look at this in the New King James. Okay. Verse number one. Of Genesis chapter number three, verse one. Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. Now you don't know just from reading this all the details of what happened there. You don't know the history of this. You don't know what happened in between things to bring us to this particular moment. But you find out through other scriptures what happened. You know, and I know, we have the advantage of already knowing who that serpent is. And the devil himself is a liar and the father of it. So we know these things about him already. But Adam and Eve communed directly with God. There'd have been no reason they couldn't have sought their Lord. And really, honestly, it was a very simple thing that they should have never even gotten into. And look how the devil handles it. He doesn't talk to Adam. He talks to Eve. Now, why is that a problem? Because Eve wasn't the one that God gave this command to in the first place. Nothing to do with one being a man or one being a woman or anything like that. But the fact is God said this to Adam. So we're moving away from where this actually happened. So there's more opportunity for things to, to get messed up here. So the serpent uh, was more cunning than any beast that, uh, that the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, not Adam, but to the woman, see? What did he say to her? Has God indeed said you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? Right away, trying to make you question him. 
And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree, which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat of it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. Wait a minute. When did he ever say anything about not touching it? And the answer is he did not. He never said that. He didn't say anything about not touching the tree. He just said, don't eat of it. And this is what we do. So you add, you modify the philosophy. Now they touch the tree, nothing happens. Well, maybe I can eat it too. Hmm. Okay. Now, Verse number four, then the serpent said to the woman, now get ready here, my friends, because what is happening, he is about to rob her. He is setting her up for the moment that everything gets messed up and the fall occurs. He's setting her up for the robbery right now. Pay attention to this. Verse number four, then the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. For God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So he's saying, no, the problem isn't, you know, the only reason God's telling you that is he don't want you to be like him. And ladies and gentlemen, you have just witnessed the moment that the robbery is about to occur. Because he told them the biggest lie by injecting misinformation into this modifying the philosophy, making them question God. And here's where he can now, he's got them set up. He robs them because my friends, listeners, get this. They were already like God. Glory be to Jesus. They were already like God. You couldn't get any more like God than Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. But the devil made them question and modify this. So philosophy. There's the robbery. And we know. Now, call. What happens from there. There are. Some really. Oh my. There are some really messed up philosophies out there. And sometimes. We don't even know where we got them from anymore. Sometimes we don't even know where this nonsense came from that you hear. But you get the wrong philosophy and it's going to cause you to come to the wrong conclusions. It's going to cause you to have the wrong response. It's going to cause you because, ladies and gentlemen, in the absence of knowledge, darkness prevails. And in the scriptures, we see that in his, my people perish for lack of knowledge. Philosophy. You hear somebody say, God helps those who help themselves. And people start shouting praise over that. Where did you get that from? God never said that. They think maybe that was Ben Franklin, although now they say it was maybe even somebody before him who said that. But God never, that's not in God's word. You will not find that in scripture. That is not scripture. Well, the Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. Now, there was someone in scripture who said that. You know who that was? That was Job. When you begin to understand Job, you realize that we have misrepresented Job in almost every way possible, except the fact that he was faithful to God. That is true. But there's a lot we don't understand or didn't understand about Job. Sometime I'll share the story with you because it's part of this, but not today. But I'm telling you, don't base your life on Job. You got people going around saying, well, it is, uh, it is wrong for a, a pastor or any Christian to be rich because, because God says that money is the root of all evil. Well, first of all, God never said that. Never did he say that. He said the love of money. 
is the root of all evil. You see, money is neither good nor evil. It's what you do with it and how you use it that determines that. And because of that, people have come up with all kinds of ridiculous notions that they ought to remain in poverty in order to demonstrate their holiness or in order to, order to earn favor from God or something ridiculous like that. Poverty. Let me tell you, poverty is a part of the curse. And when you finally discover this truth, you want to be mad at people until you realize, hey, they didn't have the right lens on. They believe poverty is God's will. I guess they must have gotten their glasses from the thrift store. <laughs> Where'd you get that from? Where'd you get those glasses? Where'd you get those glasses? You know, uh, these people who, uh, you hear somebody preaching a, you know, a memorial service, a homegoing service, whatever you want to call it. And I don't like the word funeral, but, you know, a homegoing service. They'll say, well, God just needed another flower for his garden. You think about, dude, what are you talking about? He just planted something last week. And not only that, but you have people who are already in a delicate state. A delicate state of mind. And you're going to say that nonsense to them. They might just believe it. Where'd you get that from? Sometimes it's completely clueless stuff. Sometimes we don't even know. Maybe we got something from a song or something. You don't know. I mean, it's very possible. You hear something in a song and you suddenly believe it's in scripture. Next thing you know, you got a preacher up there saying, Mamas, don't let your babies grow up to be cowboys. <laughs> let them be doctors and lawyers and such, right? <laughs> Where'd you get those glasses? Where'd you get that from? Where do we get our philosophies from? Where do we get what we believe? Now, let me show you the process. Allow me to take you on this journey by starting in Proverbs uh, chapter number four. Okay, we're going to go to the 23rd verse of the book of Proverbs, and I'm going to show you something. We're going to work backwards here. We're going to work backwards. Uh, so when we read this, we are understanding that this is... Um, the word heart is, is your soul, your mind, will, and emotions. And I want you to read verse number 23, Proverbs uh, 4 and 23 says, Keep your heart with all diligence. Keep your heart with all diligence. For out of it spring the issues of life. It is also stated by Jesus that it is out of the abundance of the heart that the mouth speaks. And we also know, Jesus many times said, and I'll show you as we progress through the fundamentals of faith, that he said, we'll have what we say. That he said, according to your faith. So what does this all mean? It means there is a direct correlation between what is in your heart and what your life looks like. If you were to sit down with me and tell me, where you are in life, what your problems are, and where you actually want to be, we would be able to start talking. And as long as you're willing to share with me and you're open with me, I'll be able to tell very quickly where things got off track. Now, I don't say that as a means to condemn anybody. In fact, I wouldn't even share it unless God directed me to by his Holy Spirit. And, and, and he could show me things directly by his Holy Spirit, even if people don't. But again, that's not meant to be a condemnation kind of thing. That's not meant to be anything that I use as a, a way to beat people over the head. But someone who genuinely wants to know how to fix their lives, I can tell you if, if we talk long enough where things went off track. And it's something to do with the heart. In other words, the mind, will, and emotions. If you want to know what why things have gotten bungled so badly in your life, you need to take a look at your heart. If you want to be able to make a change to your life, then you got to change your heart. If you want to know where, where your life came from, why it looks the way it does, you need to examine what's been in your heart. Out of it spring the issues of life. So what your heart is, that's what your life is going to be. 
If you want to change your life, you need to start by changing your heart. Now, let's work backwards from the heart. Jump to Proverbs 23 and verse number 7. Now we're talking specifically about the mind. Now the soul, you know, that encompasses that. But again, heart knowledge is different from head knowledge. We already discussed that. Gnosko is the is the intimate of the heart. And there is a, possible, uh, a possibility of what is just the mind. And that is not as deep of a level. So I want you to look at the 23rd chapter of the book of Proverbs, the 7th verse. For as he thinketh in his heart, so is he. Now, Listen to the way I am reading this to you because God showed me this and, and, and he showed me, me through another preacher and I, I don't put my faith in preachers. I put my faith in Jesus, but God uses preachers and I believe this, this man is obedient to God and, and God used him in this and I 100% as I have studied this and I've learned about the fundamentals of faith, I 100% agree. Listen to the way I'm going to read this to you because I think we, we have read this wrong. Listen. For as he thinketh in his heart, so is he. Let me say it again. For as he thinketh in his heart, so is he. For as he thinketh, comma, in his heart, so is he. Remember, the translations of scripture sometimes don't quite capture things in the exact same way. Remember that a lot of these original languages did not have punctuation, and I'm convinced that the comma is in the wrong place. For as he thinketh, comma, in his heart, so is he. In other words, I am in my heart what I think in my mind. So if you want to change your heart, you've got to start by changing what you're putting in your mind. If you want to change your life, you're going to have to change your words. If you want to change your words, you're going to have to change what's in your heart. If you want to change what's in your heart, you're going to have to change what is in your mind. There is so much that we hear that we should not be hearing. We are bombarded constantly by negative reports. We are bombarded constantly by circumstances in the fallen world because that is the world in which we live, but it is not the plane on which we are required to operate. We can live above all of that nonsense. But the beginning is changing what goes into our mind. Because all you have to do is watch the news for five minutes and you will be hearing nothing but negativity. And then you talk to most people and that is reinforced. Most people, even the ones who claim to be positive thinkers, which this is not about thinking positive. This is about believing the truth. But you understand what I'm saying. Even those who, who call themselves positive people, and quite honestly, the vast majority of those who call themselves Christians are still extremely negative when you really break it down. Because I've actually heard Christian people say to me things like, there is no cure for Alzheimer's. Or... I always end up with the flu every year. You know, comments like that. Oh yeah, I believe in God, but God doesn't always heal. They'll say. Mm, boy. They're praising God one minute, speaking in tongues, quoting scripture. And the next minute, I'm going to offend some people now. I know it. And I apologize. I'm not trying. I'm not trying to do that honestly, God knows I'm not trying to do that. I hope you believe me too, because I love you, but I will never lie to you because I love you. You understand? But I'm, I know I'm about to offend some people now. There are people who are praising God, shouting praise, speaking in tongues one minute, and two minutes later, they are complaining, oh my goodness, I cannot believe this hamburger cost me whatever it costs. The prices are just going up. It's outrageous how bad prices are. I don't know how we're going to afford things.
Take a moment. Relax. Put down the stuff you attempted to throw at your device. <laughs> I am sometimes intrigued by how much prices have changed. Absolutely. Because I remember when I was a kid, my mother used to, we, she and I'd go to the gas station and she'd put $5 worth of gas in the tank and that would be enough to, to go for a long time before you had to fill it up, you know. And I also remember going to an Italian restaurant that we loved as a family, my, my parents and I, when I was a kid. And I remember what we ordered. We'd order an appetizer, typically potato skins. We might order soup. Um, my, uh, we'd order, uh, gnocchis and meatballs. Uh, at least that's what my mom and I would get. And my dad would get, you know, ziti or ravioli, something like that. And we'd order sodas. Our bill was like $20. And today, you know, that's not the case. So sometimes it fascinates me. To see the changes. But I'll tell you what I have learned very quickly. God has spoken directly about you do not. Speak a complaining word. You do not say anything negative about this. Why? Because God says I am your source. I am your supplier. I am your provider. I am the one who makes sure you have what you need and, by the way, what you desire. I am the one who has created everything for your enjoyment. I am the one who protects you. If you go around and you start saying, things are so terrible, I don't know how we're going to manage, those are not faith-filled words. Words, according to God himself, as spoken through Brother Kenneth Copeland, words are spiritual containers. And you can either speak life into a situation or you can speak death into a situation. And speaking complaints like that is not speaking life. You are not trusting God. Oh, I believe in God, but boy, man, I, I still don't want to pay these prices. Now, God spoke to me because I started on this track of I'll pay the prices because I, I want the, the thing, whatever it is, and I can do it, praise God, because God has blessed me abundantly and I don't have to worry about it. But I started down this track of, it is outrageous. Yes, I'll pay it, praise God, I'm blessed and I can do it. But it's outrageous how bad, you know, these prices have gotten. And God convicted me even of that by his spirit because he said, you are sending the wrong message. Number one, I didn't tell you to judge the world, he said. See, scripture says, do not judge the world, but the church. He said, I didn't tell you to criticize everything that's going on in the world. He said, what I told you to do was be a blessing. What I told you to do was to spread my, my word, to show people my love. He said, I'm calling you to live differently. I'm calling you to live on a higher plane, but you won't find a ton of people who are ready to live like that. They'd rather spend half the day complaining about the government, complaining about the president. Now, there are things, look, there are things our government has done that I don't agree with. Absolutely. There are things our president does that I don't agree with. Absolutely. If God leads me to, I'll share them with you. If not, I won't, but I still can pray for him. And I'm supposed to. And I should still pray for our government. And I should still respect our government because their authority. They've been put in there by God. If I don't do that, that is now, that's now become an issue that I have created that I should not be doing. And I, I, I am amazed at how many people will sing praise songs and hymns, speak in tongues, quote scripture, and then... Resort right to negative talk and they will, they will resort to complaining the rest of the day about how bad the world is, forgetting that the scriptures say in, in um, 1 John 4, 4, 
that we have overcome and and we 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 are we have overcome um because see it says you are of god little children or dear children and you have overcome because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world the one in me is greater well what about the terrible economy the one in me is greater uh what about flu season covid the one in me is greater well what 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 what, what about the present the one in me is greater what about the one who is in me that is jesus is greater Presidents will come and go. Congressmen and women will come and go. Governors will come and go. Even pastors, by the way, will eventually come and go. And I love pastors and they're called by God. Just as, the, you know, I have a lot of great pastor friends and so forth. I'm not criticizing them, but I'm saying don't base your life on the people around you, whether good or whether, whether you think they're doing a good job or not such a good job. Why? Because the one who we serve and the one who we ought to submit to is the one who has been on his throne for more than 2,000 years and will never leave his throne. Amen. Glory be to God. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Praise God. So if you want to change your life, change your words by changing your heart. Change your heart by changing your mind. How do you change your mind? Two scriptures, and then we're going to close for today. Next time, we, we will actually really delve into what faith is and what it's not and how to put it into practice, how to build faith, grow our faith, where it comes from, and all the fundamentals. You know, Little by little, we're going to build this. As I say, it's going to take months, praise God, but we're going to do it uh, because that's what God's called us to do. But two more scriptures for today. Turn with me to Romans chapter 12. And... Um, Let's, let's go there. Uh, here we go. And uh, we're going to look at verse uh, number two. And you can read verse one. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, uh, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Now, we will unpack that later as well. Praise God. But here's verse number two. This is what I want you to see. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. That you may prove, when you prove something, you give evidence to it. So how? By the renewing of your mind. That's what you be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Ladies and gentlemen, the renewing of your mind must be a lifelong process, not a one-time occurrence, not an occasional event, not something you do periodically. Will remove your, renew your mind to what? To the word of God, to the truth. You shall know the truth and the truth will make you free. Renew your mind to God's word. I said two scriptures, but there's a third one, praise God, because God just laid it on my heart. Joshua 1.8. And this book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but in it you shall meditate day and night that you may observe to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous and you will have good success. Not maybe, not might, not possibly, but will. We must become constant, relentless, obsessive even, students of the ever-living Word of God. That is how we change what is in our minds. And that is the beginning of what will eventually become what's in our hearts. Because as we thinketh, so we are in our hearts. That's why he said, Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. The word that's used for word there is the direct revelation of God. There are, uh, there's more than one word <laughs> for word in, in the original language. And, and the two that we often talk about are logos and rhema. Logos is the written word. Rhema is the, the revealed word, like the spoken word directly for you from God. But you will, you will not get the rhema until you dig into the logos, you see. And 
that is why when when that's when that scripture says faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word, that word is Rhema. It's the spoken, revealed word of God. How does that happen? Gnosko. Intimate knowledge. And how does that happen? It starts with the word. It starts with the written word. And finally, let's go back to Proverbs, where I can give you another um, uh, confirmation of this. Because um, you never want to build doctrine off of isolated scripture. But we don't have to, praise God. So here's... Um, oh, here's what I want. Proverbs, praise God. Glory be to God. And I want you to look at... Um, Oh, verse number, verse number 20. Um, praise God. Hila bakto robo mamash kandolo roko sadai. Re niriya boko re la laktai. There we go. Glory to God. Verse number 20. My son, give attention to my words. Incline your ear to my sayings. Do not let them depart from your eyes. Keep them in the midst of your heart, for they are life to those who find them and health to all their flesh. I shared with you the other day, the message paraphrase says, those who discover these words live, really live, body and soul, they're bursting with health. Hallelujah. We want to be and we are bursting with health. Amen. Amen. Glory be to Jesus. Glory to God forevermore. But you see, it begins with the word. We understand truth. We understand philosophy. And we understand that God has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. Now, we're going to begin to unpack that in the future broadcasts. We're going to unpack the fundamentals of faith. And that is one of the first parts of it. One of the first parts of it is to build your faith by the word. But we will examine and study and meditate on the word as it pertains to the fundamentals of faith. And we already looked at some of them today, even though you didn't know it. But you'll find out that Jesus said, believe in your heart and speak with your mouth. What you believe in your heart and do not doubt. But then you have whatever you say. Fundamentals. Fundamentals. We're about to uh, watch the uh, Philadelphia Eagles uh, take on the Kansas City Chiefs in the Super Bowl this coming Sunday. I'm not a big sports fan at all, but I love the Super Bowl because we have family and friends together, and we have lots of snacks and food, and, you know, we just have a good time. I uh, usually end up playing board games with people while the Super Bowl is on, and we have air hockey and foosball and a pool and those kinds of things also. I used to watch the halftime show. Now I don't even do that, because as I've gotten closer to Christ, that stuff's become less and less appealing, and it's gotten worse, too. I think there probably were some reasonably decent halftime shows, but I don't know about this year. I You know, I'm not going to say anything about it. It hasn't happened yet, but I'm just saying in the past few years, but, um, so I'm, I'm hardly watching the thing, but I, I, you know, I love the, the, the fun and the fellowship, but I know enough about the Super Bowl to know what it is. And the question brother Copeland asks is what are you watching when you watch the Super Bowl? Or you could put it to the world series, or you could say, um, I don't know, Wimbledon, or even, you know, something else. Maybe you're into the arts and maybe you're into singing. What are you watching when you watch American Idol and these these top-notch performers? You are watching masters of the fundamentals. People that have mastered so well the fundamentals that they can go on to the next level and beyond and beyond and up and up and up. And even if you've been a Christian for decades, sometimes we need, and quite often, in fact, we need to revisit the fundamentals. Because as I think, I am in my heart also. And what I am in my heart is going to determine 
the path for my life. If you don't like your life the way it is, it's not too late. You can change it, but it's got to start by changing your heart, changing your mind, renewing your mind to God's word. Now, Father, I want, to, I, I want to praise you and I want to thank you and I love you and I worship and exalt you, God. Glory be to Jesus. Uh, knees being healed in the name of Jesus. Knees being healed. Knees being healed right now. Praise God. Glory be to Jesus. Um, my my son even had some sore knees. He 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 was told by a doctor a while back that he's got this Osgood slaughter condition that some some younger folks have, and and uh, I reject that. I mean, maybe the maybe the evidence showed it at the time, but you know what? God says he's healed, and I claim that for him too. In the name of Jesus, you claim it for you. Uh, chest chest congestion being healed right now. Chest congestion, tightness of the back, pain in the rib cage. I don't know what it's from. Doesn't matter. God knows. Praise God, you're healed in the name of Jesus. Father, I thank you and I worship you. I praise you and I pray that you make this real to everyone listening to it. And I pray a special blessing upon their lives in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Now, my friends, if you have never accepted Christ as Savior, then this stuff is not going to work for you. That's the first step. Come back to Christ if you've walked away or if you've never accepted him. Accept him now because you need him. Otherwise, you're ultimate destination is indeed a devil's hell. But if you accept him, your ultimate destination is eternal life with God and blessings so abundant even on this earth right now that you can't even keep track of them. So the question simply is, do you believe it and are you ready to accept Christ? Don't wait to get yourself cleaned up. It doesn't work that way. God loves you the way you are and wants to accept you right now. Pray something like this with me. Lord Jesus, I am a sinner and I need you. I recognize that you are the son of God. I know you died to take my place and I believe in you. Come into my heart, rescue and save me. I submit to you. I surrender my life to you. I love you and I praise you. Take my life and turn it into something magnificent as you created it to be for your glory and for the benefit of not only my family and me, but everybody in this world. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Now, if you prayed that prayer or something similar to it and you actually genuinely believed it in your heart, then we believe you just got born again. Praise God. Glory be to God forevermore. The angels in heaven are shouting and rejoicing. God is rejoicing. Praise God. He loves you. Now what you need to do is you need to get into a good Bible-based church where the word of God is preached uncompromised and you can be spiritually fed. If you are looking for an online church, consider some of the following names. Creflo Dollar, Kenneth Copeland, Jesse DePlantis, Charles Caps, Bill Winston, uh, um, Jerry Savelle, uh, and also uh, you may want to uh, check out the uh, World Changers Church, that is Creflo Dollar. Eagle Mountain International is George and Terry Pearsons. Terry is Kenneth Copeland's, Kenneth and Gloria Copeland's daughter and her husband, George. Uh, they pastor that church. Both have online streams. You can find these things on YouTube. You can find them on Apple Podcasts, other platforms, and with a Google search. Uh, in addition to that, stay on the word, my friends. And whatever you do, that's the number one thing. Stay on the word. Keep renewing your mind and pray. Be in prayer about a faith partner, a faith buddy. And hopefully, you know, you, you, will, you will say, well, you know, I got to look at the friends I have. Is this really what is right for my life? And, and you know what? God's going to help you with that. You, you submit to God. You trust him. And we know, we know without a shadow of a doubt that he'll lead you to the right people who will help you and your family to stay challenged, to stay in faith, to stay on the word, and to, to look at things the way that God sees them. I want to thank you for tuning in today. This has been awesome. Praise God. I believe it'll bless you. I, I've been very blessed. Glory to be to God. I, I hope you are as well. And we will see you tomorrow on The Vessel. <laughs>